Good day, everybody. Steve Hollander here from Micro Ministries. And yes, we are back again with the Word of God. And we love to share it with you. We're going to continue with the words of Jesus. Because we believe that if we, who are disciples of Jesus, and are Christians, we should, as Christians, we should be followers of his word followers of his words, and we should, uh, you know, hold on to his words. Because he said in Matthew 24, verse 35, that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. He confirmed it in Mark 13, Luke 21. So there's so many, um, you know, times in the word of God that we see that the words of Jesus, who is God, will never pass away. So we better learn what his words are. And then if he said it 2,000 years ago, we can still believe that this is still what he's going to say today. Amen. John 6 verse 30, uh, 63, he says, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So his words bring life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray together. Father, open our eyes so that we can see the wondrous things from your word. We want to thank you that you are the one who opens our understanding, our minds, so that we can comprehend and understand fully your holy scriptures. We thank you that your word says in Isaiah 50 that you are the one who opened our ears and we choose not to be rebellious against your word and not to turn aside or turn away or to black backslide. We thank you for that, Father, that your promise are still true. When we find your words and we eat your words, that your word becomes in us joy and rejoicing of our hearts. And that is my prayer, Father, for each and every one today listens to this message because you are the one who do not change we thank you for that father you are the same yesterday today and forever and we can trust your word all the promises that you've promised promised us you will fulfill in jesus name amen okay so the words of jesus now, one of the questions I got asked this week was, what is the purpose of our, our life? And that's one of the four men, uh, fundamental questions that every, every man and woman asks as we grow up. You know, um, who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? You know, where's my, what is my destiny? Um, stuff like that. And when we, when we can sum it up, our purpose is to walk as our Savior, Jesus, walked. That's basically, if you look at 1 John, 2, chapters, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, he says, He that says that he abides in him, that is in Jesus, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So how did he walk? What did he say? The words that, you know, that we have, we should, uh, you know, Hold on to his words. The words that he spoke, we should speak. The things that he taught, we should be teaching to people. And what was his, um, you know, message to all of us before he went up into heaven, into glory? Matthew 28, we're going to get to that. But the Great Commission is go and make disciples of all nations. Teach them everything that I've taught you and baptize them. You guys know the, the Great Commission, but today we're going to continue with um, the book of Matthew, chapter 19, and we're going to read the first 10 verses there. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings uh, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. And 
the Pharisees also came to him, testing him, saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? You see how carefully they, you know, they change the question or they ask the question. It's very crafty. You know, um, they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And then they add that just for any reason. Then he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he that made them in the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife. Come one. Eh? And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate or put asunder. They said to him, why then did Moses command to have a, to give a, do, a, a, a certificate of divorce and put it put her away. So then they they quickly to quote scripture to him. You know um, why then did Moses command us to give uh, you know a certificate of divorce so we can divorce our wives? But then he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And what's amazing to me is every time the Pharisees and the uh, Sadducees and, you know, this, you know, these leaders, spiritual leaders asked him questions. Jesus always went back to the beginning. Because in the beginning, it was not so that a man can just divorce his wife. It's only because of the hardness of your hearts that, you know, Moses committed the people or permitted the people to divorce their wives. And he said to you, whosoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whosoever marries her, who divorces, commits, or is divorced, commits adultery. And his disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man and his, with his wife, it is better not to marry. And we can understand why they feel that way. You know, because if you look at the divorce right nowadays, it's the same as it is in, you know, with all the heathen people, the unbelievers. Even today, the church, people are, you know, promising to be faithful to one another and to love one another. And they quickly forget those promises and the covenant that they had. And um, Jesus said, it's, it's uh, you know, for no other reason a man can divorce his wife or a wife, her husband, if they, they have been sexually, you know, uh, unfaithful, if there's anything like that. So it's important to understand that it's not just, you know, you cannot just divorce on any matter. If your wife, for example, goes through depression, you cannot divorce her because she's going through depression. If she's not um, looking good anymore, you can just today decide, now I'm going to divorce her. No, it doesn't work like that. We must stick with the word of God. Let's, let's live like Jesus lived, walk like he walked. He said, and, and you know, hang on to his words. Keep his word. Because he said you cannot do that for just any reason. Okay, let's continue. Because in the next uh, few verses, Jesus teaches on celibacy. And, and this is actually um, something that, especially on the, uh, among the youth, we don't see people you know, do this. When I grew up, there were several people who decided to you know, to not to marry, but to live their lives just for Jesus. But we don't see that that much often. May the Lord help people to see this. Because he said, yeah, but he said to them, all cannot accept this. Because remember, his disciples said, it's better not to marry. He said, all cannot accept the same, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who, are, who were born Thus, from their mother's womb. Then there are eunuchs 
who are made Unix by men. Then there are Unix who have made themselves Unix for the kingdom and for heaven's sake. And then Jesus says something remarkable. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. I mean, if you look at, there's so many examples in the Bible of uh, people who, you know, chose to be eunuchs. That means to live a life of celibacy, you know, celibacy, not marrying and just living for Jesus. Um, and we, I think, you know, God will give you that gift. He will, if he gives you that and you can accept it, uh, that's why Paul wrote, if you're not married, don't seek a wife. And if you are, you know, um, you know, uh, married, don't seek to be single. So God has called us to to certain, you know, things, different things in, in, his, in his body. But we must find out from him the first thing that you need to do as a as a as a young person, find out and pray, Lord. Is it your will for me to get married? And if it is your will, send the right woman. Send the right, if it's if you are uh, praying for a husband, uh, if you are a godly woman, pray for that and ask him if it is his will. And if he's shown you that you will, you know, give you a promise, hold on to those promises. Amen. Then there's another principle that Jesus teach in this um, chapter, verse um, 13. Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from them. So here's a principle where we should not be sprinkling water on little children and you know, say that they are now baptized or babies because the word of God teaches that they need to believe Mark chapter 16 and then get baptized. We cannot baptize them and then later on, you know, teach them to believe. So what Jesus did to little children and babies, he just took them in his arms and blessed them. So that's a principle that gives us in his word. Amen. Now, verse 16, Jesus um, counsels the rich young ruler. Now, this is fascinating. Um, I, I've never heard this preached in any church, and I visited thousands of churches through my life. As the uh, last five years, we've been missionaries from 2019, and uh, visited a lot of churches, preached in a lot of churches, testified. But I've never heard this sermon where these, this passage preached anywhere. Um, and here Jesus shows a, a rich young ruler the secret key to enter eternal life. Let's read. Now behold, one came to him and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life. So this one wants to basically do something and then inherit, you know, eternal life. And then Jesus corrected him. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. So Jesus wants just to, it's not that Jesus is, is denying to be God. He is God. But he just wants to know for the right reason. You know, are you calling me good because you know that I'm God or are you just calling everybody good? Because not everybody is good. And that's true. And then um, Jesus says, yeah, he answers him. But if you want to in, enter into life, keep the commandments. So Jesus gives him a key and he says, to enter into life, you need to keep the commandments. And then he, uh, he asks Jesus, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> and this is it's amazing. Remember, and Jesus said, 
if you read further in, in um, uh, if you go just back to Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus said you must not murder, he said if you hate somebody, you already committed murder in your heart. So Jesus actually wants more. You know, the truth, through him came truth and grace. And Jesus expect us to do actually more than, you know, what his word originally, you know, he explained this. Um, that's why he said, don't think that I came to, you know, Matthew 5, verse 16, uh, 17 to 19. Don't think that I came to, you know, abolish the law or the prophets. Um, I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. That word fulfill means literally to preach fully, to preach it fully. And if you, if you look here, you shall not commit adultery. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He said, don't even look at lust with lust to another person. You shall not steal. Don't even, you know, entertain the thought of stealing. Don't even cover, cover whatever somebody else has. Don't uh, be a false witness. So don't even think about lying. We need to, and that's why, you know, Paul was writing and he was showing us through the Holy Spirit that we need to take every thought captive. So when those thoughts come that say, steal this or lie there, you need to say, I rebuke you, Satan. You know, um, it is written you shall not steal or it is written you shall not lie. Whatever the, the temptation came or the tempter came with. So um, honor your father and your mother. How many people are actually honoring their father now? We're living in a generation where children are so disrespectful against their, uh, you know, their parents. Um, we do counseling on a daily basis, uh, you know, marriage counseling, uh, uh, child counseling, trauma counseling, and where we see children and meet children who are so disrespectful. They don't have a fear of the Lord. I mean, a lot of people in the church even don't have the fear of the Lord. And, um, but it's, it's so sad. And that's one of the, the commandments that Jesus said, you need to keep to enter life and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then the young man said to Jesus, all these things have I done, huh? I've kept them from my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Now this is this is profound because here Jesus touch on what actually is in that person, that young man's heart, the rich young ruler. He was very rich, this young man. And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect. Now, if you read Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, at some point Jesus says, you guys, you follow me, my disciples, you need to be perfect. He says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So this guy was almost perfect. But Jesus said, yeah, if you want to be perfect, go and say, of course, I've heard, I've heard, I actually heard Christians say to me, but just pretty good is fine with me, you know. I don't need to be perfect. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, we need to be perfect. He's coming back for a spotless bride. And um, the reason why Jesus actually touched on this is because when he said this to this guy, sell all you have and give to the poor. But the young man heard this saying, eh? when he heard this saying, he went away sorrowful and he, for he had great possessions. And this is so, uh, so amazing when you think about it. Jesus loves us so much that he will, he will, whatever stands between you and him, because obviously this guy, this young man was worshiping, his God was his money, his possessions, his everything. And when Jesus said, get rid of that, come and follow me, he was like, Whoa, that's too much. And we don't read there that Jesus went after him saying, okay, now wait, wait, wait. I didn't mean to offend you. 
you know, let's have a nice, no strings attached, non-confrontational relationship. No, Jesus didn't offer him that. He let him go. Because sometimes people need to hear the truth. Because the truth will set you free. Amen? And then Jesus said something that was uh, amazing. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Surely I say to you that it's very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And when his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished. And they said, who can then be saved? But Jesus looked at them and he said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, when you hear this, I say to you, it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Some people think that it's the, you know, the eye of a needle that you work with, uh, you know, that your wife used to, or your mother used to fix your uh, clothes or whatever. No, it's not that needle. If you knew, you know, the, the Hebrew and the Hebraic language, you, and, and the, the words that they used in those days, like, remember, last time we were talking about what is a good, uh, when the, the Bible speaks about an evil eye, it's somebody that's stingy. A good eye is somebody that's generous. Now, the eye of a needle is basically, you know, uh, in, the, in, in Bible times, around Jerusalem, but around every city, there was a, a city wall. Nowadays, we don't have walls around the city, but maybe we should go back to that. But that's a debate for another day. But when you, when you look at the walls of the city, there was a wall of, um, you know, around the city and there was a, a gate at the front and that gate, the big door of that city had a small little door that was just big enough, you know, for, you know, somebody to crawl through. So when, when night come, when night time came, they will close the big door of the city and then they will only open that small little door when somebody comes with a camel or whatever. So when that, you know, person comes at night with a camel and you know almost how they loaded the camels, um, those camels were loaded very heavily. So when, uh, you know, when they come to that little door, the guy literally had to take everything from the back of the camel off and then unpack it, and then the camel can crawl through the eye of the needle. That's what they call it, that little door. So basically what Jesus is saying, when you want to enter the kingdom of God, remember, we enter the kingdom of God from this side to the other side. When you, if you want to enter God's kingdom, he says, like, you literally have to lose yourself from your earthly possessions. Literally have to get rid of all your, you know, this claim of everything that I have belongs to me. And literally have the mindset of everything now I have belongs to Jesus. When you have that mindset, that then when he tells you, give this man this amount of money, or, you know, or help that guy with this, then it's not you arguing with God saying, no, but this is mine. You know, um, I, 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 uh, is it really you, Lord, speaking to me now? No, when you hear his voice and you know everything belongs to him anyway, you are just a steward, then it's easy for you to, to let go. And that's where he wants us to be so that we can enter his kingdom and operate in his kingdom. And then when his disciples heard that, they were greatly astonished and, you know, they said, who can then be saved? But Jesus said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And this is amazing because when you get to a point, I had to get to that point. And each and every one of us has to get to that point where we say, Lord, you are my provider. I don't look at my job or at my employer or at 
whatever, whoever, for my provision, you are my provider. And then you are at the right place to basically, you're free from this, this world and the things of this world. It makes sense. Then Peter answered and said to him, verse 27, See, we have left all that we have and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So we won't be judging, judging other people. We're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel because if you watched our foundation teachings and everything, you'll find that there's no such thing. There's no scripture, um, you know, for dispensation, you know, this dispensationalism. It's a fancy word that somebody thought, uh, you know, up from the Roman Catholic Church. And it's all a lie. Um, we as the Gentiles are grafted into the church, which is Israel. If you read Revelation, there's also the New Jerusalem has, has got 12 gates, and the 12 gates are the 12 tribes of Israel. Yes, the apostles are the foundation. Uh, but, you know, they're all grafted in, built into the existing church. There's no to church, there's no the church, a 13 gate for the church or stuff like that. Watch, watch our foundation teaching. We'll see. We just have to stick with the word, guys. And then verse um, 29 says, and everyone who has left houses and brothers and sisters and fathers, mothers or wife or children or lands for my namesake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and who are last will be first. Yeah, it's, it's big, you know. We don't think of all these things. What is the purpose of life? That's to live for Jesus. The Word of God says, he that wins souls is wise. That's why, you know, we have to dedicate our lives. It doesn't matter where you are, you are full-time for the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for your precious word. Thank you that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You're the one who is, was, and is to come. You are God Almighty. Lord Jesus, we give you all the glory, Father, and our King. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day further. And then we'll see you in the next video.